Welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new. My name is Ali and today I'm teaching you everything you need to know about every single song on 1989. Welcome to part two of my deep dive into the swiftery of 1989, the Taylor, if you will. So last week I published part one of this video, which was an in-depth look at the 1989 era. So I explained everything that was going on at the time and what things really influenced this album. Whereas today we are breaking down the songs themselves. Now for Speak Now, I knew that there were a lot of people that would be discovering and learning this album for the first time, but I kind of presumed that everyone sort of knew 1989 and was familiar with it because it was just so big at the time. Taylor was everywhere. It's the most awarded pop album of all time. Like it was a big deal. But from your comments on part one, I learned that this was actually where a lot of people kind of fell off the bandwagon. And you guys said that was due to like the media scrutiny, internalized misogyny, or maybe just pop wasn't really your thing. All of that is totally fine. I know everyone's kind of been on their own journey. And honestly, it makes me more excited because it means I still have a thing or two to teach you guys. Now you might remember that for the Speak Now video, I did a fun little giveaway and I figured it would only be fair to do the same for 1989. So we do have a 1989 themed giveaway in today's video. Make sure you stay tuned for that. And also if you would like me to continue this series for our remaining Taylor's versions, reputation and debut, let me know by giving this video a thumbs up. I think it'd be really fun. And also subscribe if you haven't already. Now I am so excited to talk about this album today because it was so successful and the pop anthems were so big, but almost to the point where I think it overshadowed her incredible songwriting, which is Taylor's greatest talent and asset in my mind. And I do think that gets overlooked in this album. And my hope is that those people that did drop off due to the criticism she was facing at this time kind of have a second chance this time around to realize just how great it is. That said, I am curious to know people's album ranking order. I know we've kind of discussed mine and how I probably will never share it, but if you're feeling brave, I would love to hear yours in the comments. Thank you so much. So while Taylor's previous albums and also albums since then were all kind of a body of work mashed up with different songs about different experiences and people and a mosaic, if you will, 1989 is really one story being told from beginning to end. I remember Taylor liking this post on Tumblr. It really outlined how the album is almost essentially about one person. There are obviously a lot of songs on here that have nothing to do with romantic relationships, but the ones that do, if you know, you know. So before we dive into the first song, I actually want to go through the liner notes and secret messages because like I said, the previous albums were all kind of just a one-off mishmash line or clue relating to that song. But for 1989, it's really just one story. So our liner notes read, we begin our story in New York. There once was a girl known by everyone and no one. Her heart belonged to someone who couldn't stay. They loved each other recklessly. They paid the price. She danced to forget him. He drove past her street each night. She made friends and enemies. He only saw her in his dreams. Then one day, he came back. Timing is a funny thing and everyone was watching. She lost him, but she found herself and somehow that was everything. So as you can see, we kind of follow one chronological journey. And even if that isn't how it occurred in real life, I just love the way that she plays this out for us on the album. And I think we can all agree, <laughs> I think we all sing. I think we can all agree that there could not have been a more perfect opening song for this album than Welcome to New York. Hey, I'm Taylor. Welcome to New York. Another very little known fact. Did anyone know that I love New York City? Yes, I really, really do. I think that um, I'll get inspired by lots of things in life, not just directly my own life. Like I'll watch movies and get inspired if I read a good book. Like there could be a dynamic between the characters that inspires me. And then there's being inspired by a place. That definitely happened to me when I started spending a lot of time in New York City. Everybody here wanted something more. Searching for a sound they hadn't heard before. And he said, Welcome to New York. It's been waiting for you. Welcome to New York. Welcome to New York. This song. <laughs> I know a lot of people hate it or just skip it. I simply cannot relate. It could seem a little bit cheesy or cliche, but listening to this song whilst flying into New York, specifically on the left side of the plane, so you can see the Manhattan skyline, it just hits different. So this is of course about Taylor moving to New York for the first time. Funnily enough, I believe she wrote this song before she actually moved. It was written in January and she didn't move until March, I believe. But the symbolism of this song is just so strong. She went from being the country it girl in the home of country music, Nashville, to uprooting her life and moving to a pop culture hub like 
like New York City. This was a big moment of starting over. You know, she had just cut her hair on the Red Tour and was ready for something new. Never underestimate a girl who cuts her hair, let me tell you that. She was going through a big transformation both in her personal life and in her sound. So as you can see up here, we have some of the lover journals. And I'd love to read you an entry from around this time. So March 24, 2014, she writes, in the last few weeks, I've completely moved into my apartment in Tribeca. That's right, I'm writing this from my new bed in my new place, watching Law & Order with Meredith. Strangely, I've never felt more busy. Taylor also said, I wanted to start the album with this song because New York has been an important landscape and location for the story of my life the past couple of years. I dreamt about moving to New York, I obsessed about moving to New York, and then I did it. The inspiration I found in that city is kind of hard to describe and hard to compare it to any other force of inspiration I've ever experienced in my life. It's an electric city. In the electric city! I think anyone that's ever lived in or visited New York understands that feeling. It is just unlike anywhere else. You feel like anything is possible there. I mean, the song definitely glamorizes or maybe focuses on the great parts of New York and less on the rats and the smell of pee, but <laughs> that's probably a good thing. Did you have that sort of cliche feeling? It was like, wow. I've made it. I can be anyone. I'm in New York. I literally, that cliche feeling was literally my entire personality for like a year. <laughs> when, I, when I would be like walking down the street in New York, I'd be like, I'm going to get my groceries in New York because I'm just a girl in a big city. Like I just was fully inspired by the whole thing. Like I don't think you should ever have to apologize for your excitement just because it's like, I don't know, just because something's cliche doesn't mean that it's not something that's awesome. One fun fact about this song that I never really hear people talk about is the fact that she pledged to donate all of the proceeds from this single to the city's public school. And I know she gifted at least $50,000 to New York City's Department of Education. Incredible. If you say you don't like this song, you just don't want kids to learn. Now the move to New York and into pop was also really evident in her style at this time. She'd gone from more modest and dare I say grandma-ish vintage dresses to suddenly very current American apparel-esque matching sets, which personally I loved. And again, I will do a video on her style at some point, but this was just an era unlike anything else. And honestly, it's kind of very similar to what we're seeing today. Part of me is starting to get nervous about how famous Taylor has become again, because we're seeing a lot of the 1980s original cycle repeated and we all know what comes after 1989 so when the Empire State Building went red and white for the ketchup and seemingly ranch tweet and the NFL has her in their bio history is always doomed to repeat itself so I'm just getting nervous now to me the most notable lyric in this song is of course and you can want who you want boys and boys and girls and girls gay rights this was at a time where gay marriage was not yet legalized in the United States which is bizarre to think about because it was less than a decade ago I was actually in New York the day that it was legalized. And let me tell you, I've never seen a bigger or better celebration anywhere. I wrote the song kind of following the, uh, when, when gay marriage became legal in New York. And that was something that, you know, it's, so many of my friends had to be kind of scrutinized for who they were in love with, you know, from the time they came out. And I just, you know, I didn't want to make a big deal of it because I don't think it should be a big deal who you love. This wasn't the first or last time we see Taylor speak out in support of the queer community. In my mind, this depiction of the young boy in the main music video was being, you know, presumably bullied for being gay. And then later on in the Lover era, we obviously see so much more of that. During the Lover era, someone asked Taylor why she was so outspoken about LGBT rights. And this is something that I totally forgot, but she said her friend Todrick Hall asked her, what would you do if your son was gay? I love her so much. Like, she's my sister. I remember one time talking to her, like, when I first started talking to her, because I didn't know, honestly, how she felt about gay people, and I was like, well, clearly she knows I'm gay. I don't know if I should tell her or not. One day I asked her, like, if you were ever to have a gay child, what would you do? And she was like, what do you mean, what would I do? They would just be gay. <laughs> and it was like such a simple answer. She was like, there's nothing to do. I would just love them and they would just be gay. And she said, the fact that he had to ask me that shocked me and made me realize that I had not made my position clear enough or loud enough. If he was thinking that, I can't imagine what my fans in the LGBTQ community might be thinking. It was kind of devastating to realize that I hadn't been publicly clear about that. I guess I find that kind of confusing because to me, since like I said, Speak Now in 1989, she'd always kind of made her stance clear, but I suppose, and this might be too much of a stereotype, Type, but coming from a more conservative background and country music, maybe that's not something you can automatically assume about someone. So I will just always love that line. I know some people find it cheesy, but I think it's really important. My One Direction loving brain has to point out that the lyric, these lights are so bright, but they never blind me, is quite similar to One Direction's, all these lights, they can't blind me. There are so many One Direction Taylor Swift lyric parallels and crossovers. If you can think of any more, let me know in the comments. Something that I love about this song is that Taylor takes what can be a pretty daunting experience, packing up 
up your whole life and moving somewhere new and makes it such a celebration. I guarantee you any millennial woman who has moved to New York since this album came out absolutely played this song at some point, but I think it probably helps people moving just about anywhere. Like all of the lyrics just give this overarching sense of hope and excitement for a new adventure about to unfold. I really love that with songs like this, as well as like 15 and 22, Taylor truly solidified herself as the soundtrack for all of our experiences. We also absolutely need to acknowledge the progression from Mean singing, someday I'll be living in a big old city. Someday I'll be living in a big old city. To this. And one other lyric I really love is, took our broken hearts, put them in a drawer. Because to me, it really symbolizes that moving on from the Red era. Not only is she moving on from being the truly broken hearted girl that was writing songs about how sad she was, but also, what did we put in the drawer back in the red era? The scarf. <laughs> She's saying, we're done with that. It's over. I'm all good now. Next up, we have Blank Space. One of the greatest songs of all time. So it's gonna be forever. This song was inspired by the intriguing and insane complexities of the character that she was made out to be. Basically, Taylor was just running wild with the person that the media was portraying her as. You look like my next mistake, love's a game, wanna play. Very self-referential and tongue-in-cheek, kind of similar to what we see later in Look What You Made Me Do, leaning into the snake motif. She's basically tackling that tired media narrative of, careful, she'll write a song about you. Around the Red era, the narrative had quickly turned from a light-hearted inside joke that Taylor was okay with and leaning into, to legitimate backlash and bullying, and a way for people to really undermine her talents. So like we see later with the snake imagery and reputation, she takes this persona that she's being painted as and says, all right, what if I was that character? Let's see what it would look like if that was the real me. If that's actually how I was, such a complex, interesting character to write from the perspective of. And I all of a sudden started having so much fun writing these like zingers and one-liners that it ended up being one of the funniest songs on the record. If you make the joke first and you make the joke better, it's kind of like it's not as funny when other people call you a name. She said, every few years, the media finds something they unanimously agree is annoying about me. 2012 to 2013, they thought I was dating too much because I dated two people in a year and a half. Oh, a serial dater. She only writes songs and gets emotional revenge on guys. She's a man hater. Don't let her near your boyfriend. It was kind of excessive and at first it was hurtful, but then I found a little bit of comedy in it. To me, this is so impressive to take the stories that you're hearing about yourself and just really like own it and laugh about it. It's like when your parents or teachers just tell you to like ignore the bullies and just try and have more fun than them because that's the ultimate revenge. You're essentially just beating them at their own game. Now, you guys know I love an incorrectly heard lyric. <laughs> However, got a long list Starbucks lovers has never made sense to me. I know I can't judge because I did think it was come back, come back, come back to me, Eli, but at least that makes grammatical sense, right? Like what does Starbucks lovers even mean? Please confess in the comments if you did hear that or if you have any other misheard lyrics. So Taylor has said about this song that it's kind of a mashup or mad lib of like all of her greatest one-liners. In the years leading up to this song, she would just think of a line and write it down in her notes and they wound up being woven throughout the song. I think the greatest example of this is Darling, I'm a Nightmare, Dressed Like a Daydream. I get drunk on jealousy, but you'll come time you leave cause darling I'm a nightmare dressed like a daydream she also said I was on a boat once and I came up with the line so it's gonna be forever or it's gonna go down in flames and I didn't use that for a year until I was writing blank space and I was like oh but another line I love is love's a game wanna play because it parallels state of grace when she said love is a ruthless game unless we play it good and right and also because we were born to be the pawns in every lover's game mastermind I just love her take on love and I feel like in this era as we see with new romantics it's really evolved her view on love and relationships isn't so black and white anymore. A little fun fact for you, this song dethroned her previous single, Shake It Off, from the top 100, making her the first ever female in the charts history to succeed herself at number one. And I also think it's very important to know about the hidden lyrics in this song. <laughs> if you've seen the 1989 concert movie or attended the concert, you'll know that in a part of the song, there is a space that she filled with the city's name. And in the concert movie, it happened to be Sydney. I can't hear this part of the song without hearing Sydney. Sydney! Boys only want love, it's torture. 
Now the liner note for this song is, there once was a girl known by everyone and no one, which kind of perfectly summarizes her relationship with the world. Like she was truly the most famous person at this time. Funny that she's now that again. And the world really thought they knew her and yet I just don't believe that is true. I don't think we really ever know anyone unless, you know, unless we know them personally. But you know, she was kind of just commentating on how ridiculous the idea that the world and the media had of her was and saying, you guys just don't get me at all. And now it is time to talk about the greatest pop song of all time, Style. The way I feel when I hear this song, Sometimes I hear style and I think if I could only listen to one Taylor Swift song for the rest of my life, this might be it. So Taylor said that once she finished style, she knew she was done making 1989. She said there was a huge missing piece and style filled that for sure. Not only did it complete the album, it completed me. <laughs> and I cannot stress enough how important this song is, but also like the meaning behind it. Style is about the person that you're never really truly done with. Like you kind of have been on and off, floating in and out of each other's lives, much like a satellite, to the point where <laughs> Makes me blush just thinking about it. To the point where she said, this person might just interrupt your wedding. Those relationships that are never really done. You know, you always kind of have that person, that one person who you feel like might interrupt your wedding and be like, don't do it because we're not over yet. Um, I think everybody has that one person who floats in and out of their life and is never, tr like the narrative's never truly over. I would argue that Taylor has never been so bold <laughs> with a song and like telling the world who it's about. Between Dear John and Style and like using people's names, which do you think is more clear? So she's also said, I talk about in another song on the record about a crooked love, which is kind of never quite synced up right. Referencing I Wish You Would. We can deduce that these two songs are about the same person. Where a crooked love in a straight line down, meaning they knew ahead of time, like this was always gonna crash and burn, but it's worth going for it anyway. Well, I realize this very much resembles a theme that we've seen Taylor explore previously on Treacherous. Uh, I wrote Treacherous with Dan Wilson and we, we came up with, um, you know, a way to say, you know, this is dangerous and I realize that I might get hurt if I go f through with this, if I move forward with you, but I want to, you know? And it's like that kind of conflicted feeling of being a risk every time you fall in love. And especially with certain types of people. <laughs> and you guys reminded me in the comments of my previous video that the secret message on Treacherous is of course, won't stop till it's over, which we already discussed were the correct version of the lyrics that Taylor got the temper trap to write down for Harry since he had the lyrics incorrectly tattooed. So I was out here talking about how it was such a funny story and I couldn't believe she hadn't referenced the mistaken tattoo in a song, yet obviously she already had. And honestly, so much of this album is about that, either the beginning of the relationship where you no, it's not gonna last. Well, it's gonna be forever. It's gonna go down in flames. Or reflecting back on this love and thinking the timing just wasn't right. Something just wasn't working out, but it's someone you're never quite really over. The little lyric details like lights are off, he's taking off his coat, pick me up, no headlights are all little kind of clues and key details about the fact that this was such a high profile relationship, but highlighting all of the ways they tried to keep it private. When she said, <laughs> you've got that long hair, I felt that. Fellow long hair Harry stands, this is our time to shine. How do you feel when someone does that to you when Taylor Swift writes a song? I think about what it means to me to write a song about somebody else and for someone else to do that you know it's like flattering even if the song isn't that flattering you've still spent time on it and and ultimately using Taylor as an example she's a great songwriter. We write from personal experience. I think everyone does. And she's really good, so they're good songs. So I'm lucky in that sense. Now I wanna mention, during the Red Era, when Harry and Taylor were first seen together, the entire world was not very supportive of this. So they originally met at the Kids Choice Awards, I wanna say, in March of 2012. And as they started being seen more and more together, directioners were not okay with this. I cannot even tell you the memes that were made, jokes and the tweets. There was just so much, let's be real, internalized misogyny and jealousy coming from One Direction fans. I understand that it was probably 14 year olds, jealousy is normal, but it was just not good. What did I tell you about the references? I'm sorry, but she also just directly name dropped One Direction's greatest album in the bridge. Is anyone else not able to hear the chorus of this song without picturing Harry's little dance? Oh, 
so on that note of misheard lyrics, in this song we have Fade Into View. Which a lot of people heard as fake interview. Now this one makes a lot more sense to me and I would forgive anyone that thought that. Again, it's not one that I heard, but I get it. I respect it. Now the guitar on this song, which is arguably the greatest guitar on any song ever made. <laughs> is supposedly inspired by Daft Punk. Now this tells me that I need to go and listen to some Daft Punk because I'm not familiar with any of their music, but it's mostly interesting because if you remember from part one of this video, losing the album of the year Grammy to Daft Punk is kind of a big catalyst for what we see with this album now. If anyone can recommend some Daft Punk songs, maybe I should just listen to that album. <laughs> and also Taylor played this song for her friend Ella, AKA Lord, as they were driving down the PCH, which was just a beautiful coastal highway in LA. And later that day, Lord tweeted this and and I simply have to agree. I just truly don't know about a song. This is also where we see the beginning of the vehicular manslaughter <laughs> rumors because we have the lyric, he can't keep his wild eyes on the road. But we also have, so it goes. So it goes. Which we see repeated in many other Taylor Swift songs. And so it goes. And so it goes. So it goes. I really just love when she comes up with a phrase that she likes and reuses it over and over again. Now in researching for this video, I read somewhere the other day that, that this reminds someone a lot of the rumored romance between James Dean, who she references in this song, and Marilyn Monroe. So I was never aware that they, you know, allegedly had a fling, but it's interesting because we have this James Dean character, you know, slicked back hair, white t-shirt, just a gorgeous human that all the girls and gays are in love with. And then Marilyn, this blonde, red lipstick, American icon, and the power of that dynamic. Oh my gosh, so interesting. And again, that theme of someone that you're never really over or never really done with. We see that a lot in the lyric. And when we go crashing down, we come back every time. One of my favorite lines is, and I got that good girl faith and a tight little skirt, which we kind of dove into on my video of like religious context within Taylor Swift songs, which I will leave below. I just think it's such a great visual and line for her. She had really been looked at as sort of this good girl, I guess. You know, came from a Christian household, had good family values, and yet the girl could wear an outfit. Oh my God. I can't believe that in less than a month, we're gonna hear style Taylor's version. Do I need to be nervous? Finally, the secret message for that song is her heart belonged to someone who couldn't stay. What does that remind us of? Track five, all you had to do was stay. But also track seven, I wish you would. Next we have track four, Out of the Woods. The number one feeling I felt in the whole relationship was anxiety. It felt very fragile. It felt very um, tentative. And it always felt like, okay, what's the next roadblock that's gonna deter this? What's, how long do we have before this turns into just an awful mess and we break up? Is it a month? Is it three days? You know, I think a lot of relationships can be very solid and that's kind of what you hope for, solid and healthy, but that's not always what you get. And um, it doesn't mean that it's not special and extraordinary just to have a relationship that's fragile and somehow meaningful in that fragility. Are we out of the woods yet? Are we out of the woods yet? Are we out of the woods? Are we in the clear yet? Are we in the clear yet? In the clear yet? Good. So this song tells the story of a relationship that was kind of doomed from the very beginning. And I love that even though she knew it wouldn't last, it was worth experiencing anyway. That's something that I don't think younger Taylor would have necessarily agreed with. So a lot of this song is very repetitive. I mean, just look at the lyrics, you know, we see a lot of the same thing over and over again. And that to me is used to depict the anxiety and ruminating thoughts that she had about this relationship. You know, the stress of, are we okay yet? Like, are, is it safe? Is our relationship gonna be okay? And how that just kind of played on repeat. Love is out of the woods. Oh. And I love the chorus on it because you say, are we out of the woods? Are we out of the woods? Are we in the clear? And it just reminds me so much of when you start dating someone, and it's almost like you can't wait till you hurry up and get to get to the I love you's it's because the then you're anxiety. like, we're in the clear. <laughs> We've made it. Yeah, that was another song that I feel sounds exactly like that emotion, that frantic anxiety of wondering if you're on solid ground yet. And um, I wrote that about a time in my life where I was in a relationship that just kind of, I was always kind of wondering, like, where do we stand? Where do we stand? Mm -hmm. What are we? I mean, and I think that song kind of celebrates the fact that all relationships of any kind can enrich your life, even if it's full of anxiety, mm -hmm. even if it ends, even if, it, if you don't know where you stand, even if the floor could drop out from under you two steps ahead of you. 
um, I think that song really kind of celebrates the fact that even if there is that constant question mark, it can still be something exciting and still something you're willing to go through. Again, with that relationship that is kind of always on and off and never really done, she says, we were built to fall apart, then fall back together. I guess you could say they never really go out of style. This song, of course, has one of our most iconic bridges of all time. Remember when you hit the brakes too soon, 20 stitches in a hospital room. So on that, Taylor said, that line is in there because it's not only the actual literal narration of what happened in a particular relationship I was in, it's also a metaphor. Hit the brakes too soon could mean the literal sense of we got in an accident, we had to deal with the aftermath, but also the relationship ended sooner than it should have because there was a lot of fear involved. And that song touches on a huge sense of anxiety that was kind of coursing through that particular relationship. I don't think it's ever gonna be easy for me to find love and block out all those screaming voices. Kind of makes me happy to think that modern day Taylor would look at that and think, well, I have, I have been been able to find love and block out those screaming voices. Now, as she explained, this was a literal situation that happened to her with hitting the brakes. Harry and Taylor went skiing in Utah and got into a snowmobile accident. Again, only fueling the vehicular manslaughter of rumors and worse, the rumors that Harry Styles simply cannot drive and should never be trusted behind a wheel. Now, another lyric that we need to discuss, your necklace hanging from my neck, and then also two paper airplanes flying. <laughs> If you were wondering why I'm wearing this, now you know. This was famously Harry's paper airplane necklace that he wore and gave to Taylor. We also see it show up in the style music video and also on the 1989 tour as confetti, which I honestly have no memory of. I've been at every tour since Fearless, but most of them, I think I just black out a concert. So if anyone remembers that, please let me know. But on that note, I would love to tell you guys about today's giveaway. So when I was thinking of things that really represented the 1989 era, I could not get the paper airplane out of my head. So the first thing that I wanted to give away is one of these, a paper airplane necklace so that you can match such an iconic motif of this time, but also something else that is referenced in this song. A Polaroid camera. Truly nothing screams 1989 era like this. And of course I had to get it in blue. So I will also include some film in this and I'll write you a little letter and put it inside. So this giveaway is open entirely worldwide. I will send this to anywhere in the world. All you have to do to enter is one, be subscribed to this channel, two, give this video a like, three, follow me on Instagram, and four, comment down below with your favorite lyric from the 1989 album and why. I'll announce the winner on my Instagram story on the day that 1989 comes out. So make sure to include your Instagram handle as well so that I can tag you and get in touch. Good luck everyone. And I can't wait to read your answer. So one of my other favorite lyrics in Out of the Woods comes towards the end of the song and it's kind of talking about how she was ready to give up just because of all this fear and anxiety and I guess he said no it'll be okay. Remember when we couldn't take the heat I walked out I said I'm setting you free but the monsters turned out to be just trees when the sun came up you were looking at me. The monsters turned out to be just trees makes me think of like when you're in bed at night and you see your coat hanging on the door and it looks like a person and it's just terrifying but then in the morning you realize everything's actually fine and I'm safe and good. So I think she realized whether after the breakup or when they were still together that maybe all of those fears weren't actually that valid. Maybe she was overthinking and had this anxiety around about how the relationship just couldn't last but maybe it could and it possibly wasn't as bad as she thought it might have been. Out of the Woods also has so many parallels to one of my all-time favorite vault songs, The Very First Night. This is also the song that Taylor samples twice on a song on Midnight's. I remember, I remember, I remember, I remember. I ask you a question. Did you ever have someone kiss you in a crowded room? In my mind, this is Taylor essentially saying the question that she was talking about was, are we out of the woods yet? Next we have one of the greatest track fives of all time, All You Had To Do Was Stay. I 
I know this song gets completely overlooked and is so underrated because it just doesn't really resemble the other track fives in her discography. But in my mind, to not love this song is doing it a disservice because it is just so good. You could argue that it's her least heartbroken track five, but I think if we were to hear like a slow acoustic version of this song, it would be really heartbreaking. All I know is that you drove us off the road. Hey, all you had to do was stay. Had me in the palm of your hand. Then why'd you have to go and lock me out when I let you in? At the same time, I kind of love that it doesn't feel sad because it's very representative of this album and this era. Taylor was very happy being single. She was, you know, living her carefree life, enjoying her friends and just hanging out in New York. So her saying, people like me are gone forever when you say goodbye. is so her being like, hey, you messed up, but I'm good. Now, this was the second song written for the album. January 10th, Taylor tweeted, back in the studio, uh-oh. And then she later confirmed on Tumblr that this was about all you had to do was stay. Now, the conception of this song has to be one of the greatest of all time because Taylor had a dream that she was yelling at one of her exes and saying stay in a really high-pitched voice and that's why it sounds that way in the song. The song all you had to do was stay there's this really high-pitched stay. I had a dream that my ex showed up at my door knocked on the door and I opened it up and I was about ready to launch into like the perfect thing to say and instead all that would come out of my mouth was that high-pitched chorus of people singing stay i cannot believe that her dreams get like not only is her waking brain smart enough to write the songs that she does but her dreams also make it in there like my dreams are just about being hunted down and murdered and like horrible horrific things so i really admire this about her that line of people like you always want back the love they pushed aside but people like me are gone forever when you say goodbye she got over him because he ended things wow that is so healthy personally for me that is when i would be the most interested in the person and I would lose feelings if they liked me back. That's something that I'll unpack on my own, it's fine. I also just love the lyrics. Well, it could have been easy. All you had to do was stay. All you had to do was stay. You broke my heart. That's all you had to do. And let me remind you, this was what you wanted. And I love that in this song, she's really just turning it around onto him. She's saying, literally all you had to do was stay. It's that simple. Had you just continued to love me, it would still be working out. You'd still have it, but you left, so you don't. Because it's 1989, we of course have another car reference, another driving reference. Let's give it up for one of the greatest bridges on this album. I think we need to acknowledge the growth from stay, stay, stay to this. She's gone from begging this person to stay in her life, no matter what, to being like, well, buddy, you left and all you had to do was stay. <laughs> Next up, we have a little indie unknown song called Shake It Off. And the haters gonna hate, 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 hate. I'm gonna shake, 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 shake it off. Shake it off. Ooh, ooh, ooh. This was a song that I really like don't normally gravitate towards, obviously, because it was just so overplayed during the era. But honestly, when I listen to it, you really just can't help but dance. <laughs> This is obviously a song about blocking out the haters. Hi, I'm sorry I didn't see you there. I was too busy blocking out the haters. We don't live just in a celebrity takedown culture. We live in a takedown culture. People will find anything about you and twist it to where it's weird or wrong or annoying or, or strange or bad. You have to not only live your life in spite of people who, who don't understand you, you have to have more fun than they do. It's really an evolution from Mean on Speak Now about like ignoring the lies and the dirty, dirty treats of the world. But rather than feeling hurt and almost defensive about people's judgments of her, she's indifferent and letting it roll off her back. She said, four years ago, I put out a song called Mean from the perspective of why are you picking on me? Why can I never do anything right in your eyes? It was coming from a semi-defeated place. Fast forward a few years and Shake It Off is like, you know what? If you're upset and irritated that I'm just being myself, I'm gonna be myself more. And I'm having more fun than you, so it doesn't matter. Not only does this song show such growth from Speak Now, but also it is such a massive precursor to the rep era. Like, you know, Taylor really stepping into this era of <laughs> 
not giving a fuck essentially and really being able to step into her own self and her own power without worrying too much what everyone else thinks. I've talked before about how I think each album has a song that really reflects the album prior and the one coming up and I think this song, this is our stepping stone into reputation. Now the craziest thing to me is that Taylor didn't come up with this phrase in 2014. She actually said it a lot earlier. When you do meet somebody that you connect with and maybe it doesn't go well, you do learn from that and you grow from that and you take something away from it. And that's what you're saying. You've, you've taken something away from that that can you be a learn. positive. You really do. And you know, it's like, I'm I'm just, I'm, sh I'm trying to shake it off. I'm not ready to jump back into anything. So after the pop singles that we had on Red, like I Knew You Were Trouble and We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together and also 22, this was a whole new level of a number one hit. Like this song was everywhere. Taylor herself said that she kind of wanted it to be that song where if you heard it at a wedding and there's that one girl that hasn't danced all night but this song came on and she would have to get up and dance and honestly I would. Again, I know we kind of overlook this song because of how <laughs> overplayed it is, but the messaging is so important. And it makes me feel like if someone that received so much backlash on a global scale, daily, constantly, all day, and they can let it roll off their back, then maybe there is hope for us little people to be able to do it as well. So she said, I had a lot of days where I'd come home from school and get in the car and my mom would try so hard to console me because someone had made fun of me or someone had said something about me or not invited me to something that I was dying to go to. And she would always try to find songs to bring me out of that. Music helped distract me from that. So I think my greatest hope is that this started to be about my life and I just want it to go out in cars and speakers and earphones and become about their lives. And honestly, I think it did. So the music video for this was also deeply iconic, but also a big rebrand and reset in her career. In the Red era, the public very much had an image of her as this heartbroken, sad girl that wrote breakup songs. Whereas now she's this life of the party that's cool and having fun. And I also feel like seeing her in the cheerleading outfit in the music video is worth noting because she's gone from being, you know, the band geek in the bleachers in You Belong With Me to now that thing that she kind of looked up to. She's now front row and center, a cheerleader herself, but all the while doing it her own way. Now, a little fun fact, I would love for you to guess how many times the word shake appears in the song. It's 70. Did you get it right? Let me know. This was a song that I think her label definitely saw as a little bit too pop for, you know, this transition that she was going through. Scott Borchetta in particular asked if she could add a fiddle onto this track and thank God she said no. And Taylor had also said she was afraid of horns and like using horns in her music until this point, which thank God Max Martin and Shellback, you know, were able to safely guide her through that because they are integral to this song and some other future songs as well. And funnily enough, a lot of the sounds in this song were created using like Foley, whether that was Taylor Max Martin and Shellback using their voices as like the horns. <laughs> The secret message on this song is she danced to forget him. And that truly is the best way to get over a heartbreak, even if it's just temporary. Okay, next up we have, I wish you would. This is one of the most underrated songs of all time. It's essentially the antithesis of All You Had To Do Was Stay. And I like to think that All You Had To Do Was Stay was kind of like the front that she was putting up to be strong and say that she didn't need him back. But deep down, she confesses and maybe only to herself that she wants him back too. Now, as we discussed in part one of this video, obviously 1989 was inspired by sounds of late 80s synth pop. And to be honest, like a lot of the album doesn't sound like, <laughs> at least not the 80s songs that I listen to, but this song is one where I really hear it. In fact, I'm pretty sure she sang or at least was inspired by a fine young cannibal song, She Drives Me Crazy. It took me so long to hear that. Those snare drums are like doing that same drum loop, so I kind of get it now. This song gave us another iconic, very popular, misheard lyric. Instead of stand back where you stood, people heard stand back wasted. Let me know if you ever heard that one. I did not, but I can kind of hear it now. Again. Another car motif. One thing Taylor Swift is gonna do is get into a car. The song opens with, it's 2 a.m. in your car. And 2 a.m., for anyone that's a newer fan, 2 a.m. is very much a quintessential Taylor Swift time. It's 2 a.m. in my room. It's 2 a.m. Feeling like I just lost a friend. It's 2 a.m. and I'm cursing you on Remember that fight to 30 a.m. 2 a.m. Who do you love? We turned up. 2 a.m. running in your truck. Let through 
the darkness at 158. Until we moved on to 3 a.m. Remember in my red reaction video when I predicted the 3 a.m. tracks? So this is of course the song where Taylor says, we're a crooked love in a straight line down, which she referenced when talking about style. And this is kind of just about regretting that this relationship ever ended. She said, I wish you would come back. Wish I never hung up the phone like I did. I wish we could go back and remember what we were fighting for. I wish you knew that. I miss you too much to be mad anymore. I <laughs> just love this song so much. Listening to the lyrics of this song and how she feels about the fact that she never really communicated how much she still loves this person. It just reminds me so much of I Almost Do. Especially the lyric, because you still don't know what I never said. It takes everything in me not to call you. Now the secret message for this song is he drove past her street each night. And I'm gonna share something from one of the 1989 secret sessioners. Take this with a grain of salt, obviously, because you know there's no guaranteeing that it's correct, but, but if anyone was there and can confirm or deny this in the comments, please do. So they said, Taylor said that she wrote, I wish you would a couple of months after her and Harry broke up and they decided to become friends again. And she said this was the first time that she had become friends with an ex to the point where they were comfortable enough to talk about why the relationship didn't work out. I just love a bit of a healthy relationship and getting closure. She said he told her about how after they broke up, he bought a house literally one road adjacent to hers. Every day he would drive home and accidentally turn into her street. Okay, driver's license. And he told her how he just wanted to stop at her house and see her, but he never did. She said this song is about while he was in the car making the decision to get out and go and see her. She was just sitting in her bedroom, wishing he would make the move and go back to her and just pitch up at her house. She compared it to a classic John Hughes movie where both parties want the same thing, but neither has the guts to say anything. Honestly, she spoke so fondly of that relationship. With the John Hughes reference that just makes me picture him like standing in the yard with a boombox. This song also has arguably one of the most fun bridges. Next we have Bad Blood. Boy, what a moment in time this was. So Taylor specifically stated at the time that this song is absolutely about a woman. I think she said that she wanted to make sure this didn't get twisted in any way to be about an ex, because like we know from the previous song, she was on quite good terms with her ex that these other songs were written about. And so she said she didn't care like what the speculation was as long as people knew it was not about a boy. And she went on to say that it was actually about a fellow female celebrity who allegedly tried to sabotage her tour because they hired out her dances from under her. So as I'm sure you are, are aware this song is allegedly about Miss Katy Perry. I think it's worth noting also that around this time Katy was dating John Mayer who we are no stranger to here and given everything that Taylor went through with that tumultuous relationship when she was a teenager I'm sure it would be very hurtful to see someone else and maybe even someone else she looked up to because previously she and Katy had been very friendly now in a relationship with this person and like if I was in her shoes and my ego was talking I personally would be wondering what this man that you know had clearly wrong me and that I'm not on good terms with might be saying to this woman who was maybe an ex-friend of mine about me. So in 2016, Katie actually released a fragrance and named it Mad Love. You know it used to be Mad Love. For Taylor, who loved to trademark anything that she ever comes up with, I'm sure this would have really stung. Katie also released the song Swish Swish as kind of a response song. Swish Swish Bish. And while Bad Blood isn't my favorite song, it's actually probably one of my least favorite Taylor Swift songs. Swish Swish is somehow so much worse. Carly Kloss, who was Taylor's best friend at the time, posted this with the caption swish swish and a lot of people assumed that this was kind of her siding with Katie. I doubt that this was true. It was probably just an unfortunate mistake and coincidence. Carly was obviously in the music video along with like 25 other megastars. Honestly, this music video was the crossover event of the century, at least since the Vanity Fair is totally raining teens edition. There were just so many celebrities. It was like Valentine's Day. Just getting as many recognizable faces in there as possible Possible. But the fact that she got Ellen Pompeo and Mariska Hargitay, two of her cat's namesakes in that video, incredible. Obviously the majority of Taylor's squad featured in this video at the time. You know, we have Carly Kloss, Martha Hunt, Selena Gomez, Gigi Hadid. This is really testing myself. Hayley Williams, Lena Dunham, Ellie Golding. I always forget that Jessica Alba is in there. That's such a rogue one to me. And unfortunately a lot, if not most of these friendships dissolved after the 1989 era when Taylor was being kind of publicly canceled 
I know Zendaya was liking a few tweets that were kind of shading Taylor and Ashley, one of Taylor's iconic long-term friends, also liked a few tweets kind of confirming that Carly had taken Scooter Braun's side. It was just a whole mess. It's just really sad to see because obviously 1989 truly championed like female friendships and to see so many of them dissolve would have been really hurtful and hard. But thankfully, Selena, Abigail, Ashley, Blake and the Heim sisters, they're in it for the long haul. Anyway, the secret message of this song is she made some friends and enemies. And it was really interesting at the time, there was a lot of conversation around how if Taylor Swift is such a feminist, why is she hating on another woman? And I personally, also being a feminist, think that we should be allowed to disagree with or not get along with another woman. Just both being two women doesn't mean you have to be friends. I mean, obviously this feud has long been settled during the Lover era when Katie sent Taylor a literal olive branch and then Taylor put her in the you need to calm down music video. So this has been put to bed, thankfully. We obviously also have the Kendrick Lamar remix, which I think is arguably the more popular of the two. You live like that, you live with ghosts. You forget, you forget, but you never let it go. And people have been really sad that it's not included on Taylor's version. I might be in the minority in I think I prefer the original, but let me know how you feel. Next we have Wildest Dreams. In your wildest dreams the song that opens <laughs> with her own heartbeat. Not only is Taylor the music industry, she also just invented music. Like using your own heartbeat as an instrument? Where does someone come up with that idea? Now again, this song is what I would call Taylor's more evolved approach to love and relationship. It's like she knows that this might not end well, but she's gonna go for it anyway. In the past, I've written mostly about heartbreak or pain that was caused by someone else and felt by me. In this album, I'm writing about more complex relationships where the blame is kind of split 50-50. I'm writing about looking back on a relationship and feeling a sense of pride even though it didn't work out. I think there's actually a bit of a realism to my new approach to relationships, which is a little more fatalistic than anything I used to think about them. I used to think that you, know, you find the one and it's happily ever after and it's never a struggle after that. And you have a few experiences with love and relationships and you learn that that's not the case at all. And um, even if you find the right situation relationship wise, it's always going to be a daily struggle to make it work. If I meet someone who I feel like I have a connection with, the first thought I have is when this ends, I hope it ends well. I hope you remember me well, which is not anything close to the way I used to think about relationships. I think the way I used to approach relationships was very idealistic. I used to go into them thinking, maybe this is the one, we'll get married and have a family, this could be forever. Whereas now I go in thinking, how long do we have on the clock before something comes along and puts a wrench in it or your publicist calls and says, this isn't a good idea. The lyrics on this are just so good. Heaven can't help me now, nothing lasts forever, but this is gonna take me down. So she knows, she's like, I know this is gonna end, it's not gonna end well, but I can't help myself. Now in particular, we need to focus on the lyrics, standing in a nice dress, staring at the sunset, babe, red lips and rosy cheeks. Now I'm not gonna risk my channel getting another copyright strike for including an unreleased song, but please go onto YouTube and search the song him by Harry Styles, in which he sings, that nice dress in my wildest dreams, lipstick stains you left still on my sheets. Now I'm not saying this song's about Harry, but he at least thought it was. I'll also mention that that song opens with him saying, so you were right, there's always two, the one who stays and the one who's leaving you. And I can't take credit for this, but Genius pointed out the similarities between that and all you had to do was stay where Taylor says, people like you and people like me, two kinds of people. So in my would've, could've, should've religion breakdown video, I talk about how we see allusions to sex in songs like Sparks Fly, Treacherous, State of Grace, but Wildest Dreams really kicks it up a notch. Like you're not just gonna see me in your dreams, but you're wild wildest dreams. I think these lyrics say it best. I said, no one has to know what we do. His hands are in my hair. His clothes are in my room. No one has to know what we do. His hands are in my hair. His clothes are in my room. He's so bad, but he does it so well. He's so bad, but he does it so well. I mean, and then of course the bridge. You'll see me in hindsight, tangled up with you all night, burning it down. See me in hindsight, tangled up with you all night. 
Like we see in Out of the Woods, there is a common theme running throughout this song, which is the struggle to escape that media attention as a high profile couple, or maybe not couple, but potential couple. I mean, the opening lines, he said, let's get out of this town, drive out of the city, away from the crowds. Again, it's like, I know places. They're constantly trying to outrun and escape these praying eyes. There were rumors that this also could have been inspired by Alexander Skarsgård, who she met on the set of The Giver. I think because he's brunette and kind of tall, maybe because the music video is set in Africa, which is where they filmed the movie. Lips and rosy cheeks, say you'll see me again. And I want to mention the original lyrics from the song that were changed. The first verse slash pre-chorus were majorly changed in the final edit of the song. So originally it was, he said, let's disappear from here, drive out of the city till all the lights burn out. It's okay if we never get found, live in here forever. Better keep it to yourself. And you're so tall and handsome as hell. I don't know what you do, but you're doing it well. Say this won't be the last time, baby. It's always so weird hearing the original lyrics because like nothing hits quite as hard as what we get. Although I do always sing the original lyrics to Gorgeous. I kind of love this idea of her saying, I know that you'll reflect on our relationship. I just hope you picture it well. It's kind of a more romantic and sexy version of Long Live with when they point to the pictures, please tell them my name. We do need to talk about the absolute injustice that is the regular song version and the music video version. I'll play the two side by side so you can compare them, but the music video version, if you know, you know, but it has basically a full orchestra and it just, oh my God, the drums make it hit so much harder. Like this is the regular version. It's good. That's really nice, but here's the music video. Body chills. And while I think Wildest Dreams, Taylor's version, is one of the most perfectly accurate, you know, reproductions, I will never forgive her for not including those drums. That music video version reminds me of Flying from Peter Pan. And if anyone else loves that song as much as I do, oh my God, I love you. That song is just everything. So the secret message from that song is he only saw her in his dreams, which leads us into the next one. Then one day he came back in How You Get The Girl. Once again, an incredibly underrated song. This is a, this is basically a DIY how-to manual for winning back your girl. Essentially, this song is about what James did to Betty. I remember at the time, a lot of people were theorizing this was about Selena and Justin. I personally don't think so because I mean, if you know Taylor, you know that she is not a big fan of Justin and definitely didn't want Selena dating him. One of my favorite things that Taylor does in her songwriting, she does in How You Get The Girl, which is the kind of progression of the perspectives. So throughout the beginning of the song, she's talking about, here's what you did to her and how you get her back. And then by the end, it's like, you did this to me and this is how you get me back. Remind me how it used to be. Again, this is kind of a song about timing that just didn't really align. Like she says, say it's been a long six months and you were too afraid to tell her what you want. It's been six months since they ended things and this is Taylor wishing that he would come back. It is interesting in the chorus that she says, I want you for worse or for better, I would wait forever and ever because I want you for worse or for better kind of sounds like a wedding vow, which we obviously see later in Lover, but on this album almost feels out of place because the songs are so about like love being this like fiery burning wreck. I guess this song is a little more wistful and optimistic because she's hoping that he'll follow through with all of these things. In summary, just a great song. Next we have This Love. So I know in part one, I said that the 1989 era began in January 14th, the night of the Grammys. I do still believe that, but technically it's a lie because This Love was written on October 17th, 2012, five days before Red hit the shelves. Initially it was a poem, but she realized it could be turned into a song. And I think when you like listen to it and look at the lyrics, you can definitely see how it began as a poem. Notably, it is the only self-written song on the album. And I think it was was also her last collaboration with Nathan Chapman. Someone please fact check me if I'm wrong about that, but I believe it might be. And the fact that it's self-written is very telling because she references a lot of her other songs in the lyrics. Kisses on cheeks
my favorite lyric is by far and I can go on and on and on and on and I will. That ain't the moral of this whole channel. <laughs> my ability to go on and on about everything and nothing, it is a skill. And it's also just a very Taylor Swift thing. <laughs> Even on this album, I feel like we hear her say, well, I'm over it, I I'm done with you. And then two tracks later being like, no, actually I'm not, come back. This song really does have poetry written all over it. I especially love the kind of metaphor of the waves and the ocean, the high tides that brought them in, and then a complete 180 degrees with current swept you out again. It's It reminded me of that saying of, you know, if you love something, set it free. And if it's true, if it's meant to be, it'll come back to you. Because that imagery of the ocean perfectly aligns with and represents their relationship, the way that the waves dance right up to us and then pull away again only to return. I'll admit this was a song that initially when it first came out I didn't really gravitate towards and I think I even admitted in my reaction to Taylor's version that it's like not a song that I've ever really had a deep connection with but this is very local of me but I honestly feel like I have a new appreciation for the song since watching The Summer I Turned Pretty just because now when I hear this I picture seeing the trailer for the first time and how iconic that was and hearing Taylor's version for the first time and I just picture my boy I'm not going to reveal here whether I'm Team Conrad or Jeremiah but I'd love to hear you guys Yes, you know my taste in other men, so I feel like it might be obvious, but also I'm kind of switching back and forth depending on the day. I'm so sorry to Cam Cameron. <laughs> on October 17, 2012, we can see here in the Lover Journal the original lyrics, and I have to say it has one of the most beautiful bridges on this album. Now, the secret message for this song is timing is a funny thing, which as we know is a theme that runs right throughout this album. Once again, I don't think that every single song has to be about necessarily the same one person, but I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't mention that Harry also wrote a song called I love you around the same time where he wrote maybe if I got my timing right I wouldn't end up alone now again that message timing is a funny thing leads into the next message which is and everyone was watching which is of course the message for I know places similarly to out of the woods this is a song about the anxiety she felt around a relationship and how chaotic it was particularly with the context of how insane and public her life was this is of course a theme that we see repeated on reputation midnights and lover even Peace? Would it be enough if I could never give you peace? Like in Blank Space, how Taylor included the pen click as, you know, as a sound in the song. I Know Places begins and ends with the sound of a tape recorder. Which I think is kind of a reference to the media. Where is the news and the media? Where is the news and the media? And like Out of the Woods and also maybe Delicate, she's singing about how fragile this love is and wanting to protect it. To me, if I had to pick one lyric that really summed up the whole song, it would be something happens when everybody finds out. When the relationship is just theirs and no one else knows about it, it's, it's safer, it's more contained. You know, people don't have their opinions about it and it can't really be broken. Whereas as soon as everyone finds out, that's when the danger really occurs. I feel like one of the most popular pieces to this story is the fact that she references foxes in this song and, you know, being a fox that is hunted. When the day that they were followed and hunted, by paparazzi she was wearing a fox jumper fun fact this song was made in a day which just blows my mind again about how talented she is because it's such a great song but again similarly to out of the woods this song sounds like the anxiety she's feeling about the relationship it sounds frantic and scared this bridge <laughs> I only realized the other day what a great parallel that is. You know, we're bulletproof from told you I'm not bulletproof, now you know. I mean, the evolution from Fearless to 1989 definitely makes sense in how much stronger emotionally she is. <laughs> But that line does things to me. She and this person are never really truly done. This person just might interrupt her wedding. <laughs> Us green eyed people really won on this album. Taylor said she wanted the verses of this song to sound like a spy movie, which I think she really achieved. And one of my favorite lyrics from this is loose lips sink ships all the damn time because it just reminds me of like a Tumblr post that I feel like I would have seen back then. Next up we have truly one of the greatest songs ever written clean. Featuring the icon herself, Imogen Heap. This was such a big day for us hide and seek speeding cars girlies. Honestly, still one of my favorite collaborations she's ever done. And this is a Taylor's version that will truly ruin me. I am so excited for clean. But again, like style, really nervous because like how, how could one replicate such a perfect song? I have no notes for this song. October 27th cannot come quickly enough. And I will just be tempted to skip to this song because I love it so much. Taylor said that working with Imogen was just a dream. They recorded 
only two vocal takes and just used the second take. Imogen was just like, yep, we're all good, we're done. Like I said earlier, I feel like the pop nature of this album really meant that her songwriting talents got overshadowed a bit, but Clean is really where we see them front and center. She's comparing getting over a relationship to getting sober, getting clean. And we see a lot of references to addiction and moving on from a really intense relationship. Like with addiction and trying to get sober, you know, they say it's like you really have to take it one day at a time because it's not just you make that snap decision and you're good. It's gonna be lots of little tiny little triggers. One could also liken this to death by a thousand cuts, which brings me to one of my favorite fun facts of all time. And that is that the song Clean inspired the movie Someone Great. The creator of this film heard that song and made that film. And then Taylor saw that film, not knowing that it was inspired by her song. And then this movie inspired her to write death by a thousand cuts. Have you ever heard anything so poetic? I only just realized this recently, but they also literally walk past Taylor's Cornelia Street house. This is insane. There's always flickers of other people's work that influenced me in some way. Like, I think that when people make art, other people make art. And I think that, you know, especially women who make art, I find it highly inspiring just based on how well they told a story. And there's just something that you, you get from watching a good story take place. I, I watched this movie on Netflix called Someone Great. It's this amazing, like, well done romantic comedy with a heart and like just depth to it because it's about this relationship that ends after like eight or nine years. You know, I read the synopsis of the movie and it's like, girl goes through breakup and like goes on a trip with her girlfriends. And I think that I'm reading this and I'm like, the, the movie's going to be like, get over him, girl. He's a jerk. Let's take shots. And I was like, I'm down. Like, let's watch this movie. And then you turn it on and it's this gut punch because it actually isn't that at all. It's a movie about how she has to end this relationship that she didn't want to end because she's still in love with the person, but they just grew apart and he's not a jerk. There was he's, no scandal. There's, it's just sad wow. because it's just realistic. It's just time passed and now we're different people. And that is the most devastating thing. And so I cried watching the movie. Yeah. And so for like about a week, I start waking up from dreams that I'm living out that scenario, that that's happening to me. And I just will wake up and I'm like, oh my God, I'm writing a breakup song. Like I'd have these lyrics in my head based on the dynamics of these characters. I went into the studio with Jack and I was like, I've got these, I, these lyrics that I've written for this song called Death by a Thousand Cuts. So I write this song. We do this song in the studio and fast forward a couple months later and I'm, I'm doing the, sh the Ellen show, which I love doing. And I'm talking to her and she asks me what movies I've seen recently. And I said, someone great. I get this email a couple days later from this woman named... Jen Robinson. And she's like, hey, I just wanted to say thank you for mentioning my movie. I wrote and directed that film. It's like, I just wanted to tell you that while I was moving across the country, the album I had on repeat was 1989 and specifically a song of yours called Clean. And so I'm sitting there and I'm like, I just wrote a song based on something she made, which she made while listening to something I made, which is the most meta thing that's <laughs> ever, ever happened to Whoa. me. So each of you yeah. need producer's credit for the other person's work. Yeah. <laughs> if I hadn't connected. said in an interview that I'd seen the movie Isn't like i wouldn't have ever been presumptuous enough to think that that would mean anything to her you know shout out to the incredibly lucky people that attended the eras tour arlington texas and got the surprise song duo of clean and death by a thousand cuts because of the story and what that means you guys really are the lucky ones taylor said clean i wrote as i was walking out of liberty in london someone that i used to date it hit me that i'd been in the same city as him for two weeks and i hadn't thought about it when it did hit me i was like oh i hope he's doing well and nothing else. And you know how it is when you're going through a heartbreak. A heartbroken person is unlike any other person. Their time moves at a completely different pace than ours. It's this mental, physical, emotional ache and feeling so conflicted. Nothing distracts you from it. So to me, this song is absolutely a continuation of You All Over Me from Fearless. In that song, she literally sings, no amount of freedom gets you clean. And compared to now when she sings, I think I'm finally clean. Oh. The growth. The song also makes me think about All Too Well when she sings, I forget about you long enough to forget why I needed to. Meaning like you almost need this person to do something so horrible so that you can just hate them and move on. And then in Clean, she sings, just because you're clean don't mean you don't miss it. It's kind of admitting like, I may I may still think fondly of this person, but I'm moving on anyway. And I just love that admission that she's saying like, I'm clean of this person, I'm beating my addiction, but I still miss it. Compared to now that I'm clean, I'm never gonna risk it. In All Too Well, she's saying, 
saying, you know, I've spent so long forgetting about you that now I can't really remember why we ever ended things. And in clean, she's saying, I've come this far. I'm not even gonna risk reopening that wound because I'm finally healing. On the rep tour, Taylor performed this as the surprise song on the anniversary of her winning her sexual assault case. And the speech that she gives before performing this song makes me cry every time. I wish I could include the video here, but I've tried before and I got copyrighted because it's part of the rep movie. But if you haven't seen it, please go and watch it if that is something that you can safely and comfortably hear about. If it's not, do not worry about it, but it's just something that really moves me every time. To me, Clean really stands out against all of the other kind of love and relationship focused songs on this album. As we've said, the rest tend to depict this love that is on and off about misaligned timing and a person that you'll always be connected with in some way, whereas Clean, she's making a clean break. This is reflecting on a love that was so painful, you never want to experience it again. And you are going through the pain to free yourself from it. The imagery that you get from the second verse where she sings about punching a hole in the roof and letting the rain just wash away all of her memories with this person is so incredible. Like the double meaning of clean being about, you know, the addiction, breaking this addiction, but, but also clean in the sense that the water washes everything away. And to me, rain came pouring down when I was drowning, that's when I could finally breathe is such an important lyric because to me, she's saying you can ignore the hurt and ignore the pain and try and push through it. But once you finally let yourself feel this hurt, the rain that comes pouring down in my eyes is like a big fat cry and how much lighter you feel after that like you can breathe again. Now we need to discuss obviously some lyric parallels. We have all over me like a wine stained dress I can't wear anymore, which of course makes me think of Maroon from Midnight's, the burgundy on my t-shirt when you splash your wine into me. But also this ain't the stain of red wine, I'm bleeding love. Also the lyric, when the flowers that we've grown together died of thirst, when the butterflies turned to dust that covered my whole room, reminds me of the summertime and butterflies all belong to your creation. One day if I do a reputation video, we will talk about all of the lyric parallels from previous songs that she uses on that album. But I think one of the biggest and most important ones is Taylor singing, the flowers that we'd grown together died of thirst to then my flowers grew back as thorns. Oh, the continuation of that story and metaphor is just beautiful. And I really love the use of flowers as this metaphor because flowers are something obviously beautiful that we want to have and cultivate, but ultimately they need rain. And so we have to allow ourselves to feel that pain and let that storm come through and then pass in order for us to grow. The secret message for Clean is arguably the most iconic of all time. And that that is, she lost him, but she found herself and somehow that was everything. And now we are up to the incredible bonus tracks. It is so insane to me that these like didn't make the original cut for the album because they are some of the best songs on 1989. In particular, my favorite, Wonderland. Wonderland is one of Taylor's greatest songs. And I hope that if you don't yet know that, Taylor's version will make that very clear. Wonderland is basically a continuation of Out of the Woods and I Know Places. It's about the chaos of dating this person and like what this relationship means in the public eye. We have lyrics that say, all alone or so it seemed, that there were strangers watching and whispers turned to talking and talking turned to screams. Similarly with the theme on this album of Taylor acknowledging that something was doomed from the start, but diving in any way and like pretending she didn't know that. She sings, you and I got lost in it and we pretended it could last forever. One of the fan favorite lyrics on this song is definitely, didn't you calm my fears with the Cheshire cat smile? So for anyone that doesn't know, Harry Styles grew up in Cheshire, Cheshire, am I saying that right? So that could seemingly be a cute little nod to him. But I think it's also worth mentioning that Taylor's friend, Diana Agron, had a deep love and appreciation for Alice in Wonderland, which this song is obviously kind of inspired by. Diana's Tumblr was named after Alice in Wonderland. She also had an Alice in Wonderland theme tattoo. So at the time, obviously when this song came out, a lot of people were shipping the two of them. I think that may have been what led to Taylor tweeting this about like how uncomfortable it made her. I don't remember if it was about that or Carly Kloss, one of the two, but I simply had to mention it because Diana's Tumblr was just iconic. Whatever or whoever inspired this song, it is just so good. I should also mention that when Taylor performed I Knew You Were Trouble at the Grammys and did the iconic British accent for the bridge. So he calls me up and he's like, I still love you. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm busy opening up the Grammys. She was dressed as the Mad Hatter from Alice in Wonderland and everyone on stage kind of resembled White Rabbit or Queen of Hearts and other characters from that story. Whether it was or it wasn't about Harry, I just think it's interesting and worth noting that that performance was Wonderland themed. I love the way this song feels really steady and stable and then drops into this like chaotic pre-chorus. <laughs>
sadly we don't have any secret messages for the three bonus tracks or any tracks since then for that matter which is incredibly sad but next up we have you are in love so this song was inspired by taylor talking to one of her closest friends at that time lena dunham who funnily enough was dating someone by the name of jack antonoff so that is kind of how taylor and jack's friendship began taylor was hanging out with lena and hearing these beautiful wonderful stories of their relationship and how he treated her and made her feel and that inspired this song i wrote it with my friend jack antonoff who's dating my friend lena yes you know lena dunham yes and jack sent me this track to this song it was just an instrumental track he was working on and immediately i knew what the song needed to be and i wrote it as kind of a commentary on what their relationship has been like and so it's actually me looking in and going like this happened then that happened then that happened and that's how you knew you got you're in love again i will say this is one of the other few songs that really sounds 80s to me like that is just very, very Jack Antonoff. If I had to guess, I would say that this song has just partially inspired their relationship. And then some of it might've been Taylor's own experiences because Taylor had played this song for Lena. Like she played her the whole album as she was writing it. And Lena didn't realize it was about her and Jack. And without knowing that fact, she said that this was gonna be her someday wedding song. Taylor once said that they were the benchmark of actual real true love, which is very sad because they are obviously no longer together, but it still created a beautiful song. I think my favorite lyric in this song is and you understand now why they lost their minds and fought the wars and why I've spent my whole life trying to put it into words. Oh, I think it was like a really refreshing perspective for Taylor, having been so heartbroken in the Red Era, to see this example of beautiful, at least at the time, lasting love, kind of maybe gave her a new hope again. And like, why I've spent my whole life trying to put it into words, because she's a songwriter and she writes about love. And it's like, this is it. This is the reason that we write about love, because of how it makes us feel. Also, the lyric, you two are dancing in a snow globe round and round, we later see referenced in the Lover music video, which is just a very nice callback. And finally, we have the incredible last track, New Romantics. If I had to pick any song besides Welcome to New York to be the album opener, this would be it. It just perfectly encapsulates the newfound view that Taylor had on love at this time. On her earlier album, she really approached love and relationships with a sort of fairy tale romanticism. And now by 1989 or your mid 20s, it has a bit of a modern day retelling. There's not always just these hard and fast rules or a black and white, he was wrong, I was right, but also that she was happy being single. I think Taylor definitely has a soft spot in her heart for this song too, saving it to be the final surprise song of 1989 and the song that accompanied the announcement of 1989 Taylor's version. This was literally the song that launched us into the new era. <laughs> The lyrics that I think best sum up this song are, we're too busy dancing to get knocked off our feet. Also, the best people in life are free, which is kind of in my mind, like a perfect blank space one-liner, obviously based on the phrase, like the best things in life are free. The best people in life are free feels very 22 coded to me. It's very like happy, free, confused and lonely in the best way. Like I said earlier, we know Taylor likes to reuse or develop on lyrics that she's written. In this, obviously we hear, cause baby, I could build a castle out of all the bricks they threw at me. Later on rep, she says, my castle crumbled overnight. But even more so, now having heard the Speak Now vault, we had an entire song called Castles Crumbling. So a little history lesson for you guys. New Romanticism was a pop culture movement in the United Kingdom during the early 80s, in which both men and women wore makeup and dressed in flamboyant clothes. Boy George, the androgynous frontman of Culture Club, was typical of the genre. The song's sound resembles the new wave music that new romantic acts performed. Now, a lyric parallel that I love. In this song, we have, please take my hand, please take me dancing, and please leave me stranded. Can you guess where this is going. In Champagne Problems, we have, I dropped your hand while dancing, left you out there standing. Ouch. Also interestingly, the lights and noise are blinding, which I definitely heard originally as the lights and boys are blinding, but that kind of contrasts, the lights are so bright, but they never blind me on Welcome to New York. And I also love the lyric, honey, life is just a classroom. This is like an early nod to the motif we see on Miss Americana and the Heartbreak Prince, where Taylor compares life and relationships to being like high school dynamics. This song follows the pattern of all of Taylor's previous albums leading up to this point, which was kind of finishing the album on a high note. Previous closing tracks like our song, change, long live, and begin again, which were all quite hopeful and uplifting. Obviously we've seen since then that pattern isn't always consistent. I would love to know if you guys could only listen to opening or closing tracks from Taylor's albums, which would you pick? I would definitely have to pick opening because I mean like the one, State of Grace, mine, 
way, but then I would lose clean. That's really hard. Rolling Stone actually named this one of the best songs of the 2010s. They said, Swift making New Romantics just a bonus track was one of pop's greatest crimes. And I simply have to agree. I could say so much more about this song and this entire album, but as you can see, the lights literally are blinding me. So I think it's time to go. I really hope you guys enjoyed this video and I hope it gave you some sort of educational insight that you didn't previously know. Obviously I couldn't talk about everything. So please feel free to comment your favorite fun facts below, share something with the class. I am so excited to head into the rest of this month and hear the new album together. Thank you all for watching this far. If you've made it to the end, don't forget to enter the giveaway. I am so excited to get this stuff out to one of you. I definitely have at least one more 1989 video in me before we get Taylor's version. But until then, I'll see you guys next time. Bye.